Members, I have received notice from the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make, their na- make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their places as well as notifying the business office or the Speaker's table directly. I remind members to please be concise in asking their questions as this is not a debate per se and long introductions should not be engaged in. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with your permission and compliance with section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make the following statement on the 23rd meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council in Environment Sectoral Format, which was held in Armagh and by video conference on Wednesday 21st of October 2020. The statement has been agreed with Junior Minister Kearney. Declan Kearney, MLA Junior Minister of the Executive Office, and I represented <coughs> the Northern Ireland Executive at the meeting. I chaired the meeting. The Irish Government was represented by Eamon Ryan, TD, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, and Dara O'Brien, TD, Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage. The Council noted the work being carried out to prepare for the end of the transition period and the need for continued cooperation on environmental matters, including those of a cross-border nature. Ministers agreed to continue to cooperate on environmental issues in coming months. They recognise that it is in the common interest of both jurisdictions to work together to minimise disruption to trade and economic activity on the island. Ministers welcome the continuing cooperation on and drawdown uh, for the main sources of EU funding in the environment sector, Interreg 5A, Life and Horizon 2020, including successful delivery of Northern Ireland and Ireland partnership projects and ongoing collaboration through joint meetings, training and information events. We noted that under Interreg 5A Environment Objective, nine cross-border projects have been awarded funding totalling €89 million Euros in the 2014-2020 programme period, and collaboration is ongoing to maximise drawdown of the available EU monies and continue to implement the programmes as agreed. Ministers noted the commitment to funding Interreg 5A after the UK withdraws from the EU, allowing the projects to be continued until their conclusion in 2023, and that under Horizon 2020, Societal Challenge 5, two north-south collaborations on low-temperature anaerobic digestion treatment of low-strength wastewaters and photoirradiation and absorption based novel innovations for waste treatment were successful and contributed to the drawdown figures with 2.5 million being shared by five organisations in Northern Ireland and 0.55 million shared between two organisations in Northern Ireland. The Council noted that benefits for joint environmental priorities from a small number of life projects have been achieved through ongoing collaboration between government departments, agencies and partnerships operating in both jurisdictions. Ministers also noted that the potential to build on the success of interreg projects through access to the new Peace Plus programme 2021 to 2027 and its environmental policy objective of achieving a greener, low carbon Europe. Ministers noted the ongoing collaboration between officials in both jurisdictions and submission of joint position papers focusing on a range of holistic, clean air, water catchment and nature based solutions to address future pressures from climate change support sustainable economic recovery and protect the environment to inform emerging Peace Plus themes. The NSMC noted that the work programme will be kept under review at future NSMC environment sectors meetings having regard to particular matters arising from the outcome of the UK referendum on EU membership. Ministers agreed that within the work programme consideration should be given to opportunities <coughs> for cooperation on wider environmental issues such as sustainable development, encouraging cooperation and knowledge sharing in relation to the environmental impact of agricultural activities and related issues, cooperation and exchange information on marine uh, bathing shellfish waters, cooperation and collaboration on water and urban waste water services areas, including implementation of EU measures, the promotion of a circular economy, a joint programme of enforcement and collaboration on tackling environmental crime, and cooperating with a view to maximising drawdown of EU funding. We also agreed the proposed update, updated work programme. 
But the NSMC noted that both environment ministers are continuing to work together on target resources into joint enforcement action against those involved in illegal waste activity, including the continued exchange of intelligence and information on problem areas, with the continuation of coordinated joint inspections. Ministers noted the efforts of both administrations to increase the quantity and quality of recycling, including the publication on 4 September 2020 of Ireland's National Waste Policy 2020-2025, a waste action plan for the circular economy, and the publication of the new Northern Ireland Waste Prevention Programme, Stopping Waste in Its Tracks and the Associated Actions and Successes. We also know the ongoing work in Northern Ireland to tackle plastic pollution and the success of the extended producer responsibility schemes in Ireland and the opportunities for both administrations to share examples of good practice in this area. The NSMC welcomed <coughs> the work being undertaken in both jurisdictions to further a clean air strategy and the collaboration between officials working together to identify cross-border research opportunities and to develop proposals. Ministers noted the publication of the sec second cycle river basin management plan for Ireland in 2018 and welcomed the ongoing preparation of the third cycle river basin management plan in both Ireland and Northern Ireland. We noted that the public consultation on significant water management issues closed in Northern Ireland on the 22nd of June 2020 and Ireland on the 7th of August 2020. We acknowledge the continued support for the Rivers Trust in both in cross-border areas and welcome the level of beach awards in both jurisdictions for 2020 and the continued coordination on the clean coast and coast care schemes. Ministers acknowledge the engagement of both administrations in the work of the Advisory Group for Ireland's Marine Protected Areas, the final report of which is expected shortly, and noted the continuing engagement between the Department for Infrastructure, Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, Irish Water and Northern Ireland Water on exploring opportunities for cooperation, including applications to access the funding under the EU's New Peace Plus programme. Finally, the Council agreed to hold the next Environment meeting in early 2021. Ministers agreed to joint communique. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Melissa Mc... Sorry, William Irwin. Mr. Speaker, and uh, can I ask the Minister what steps the Minister has taken to ensure that the Republic of Ireland moves to repatriate illegal waste from the Republic of Ireland, which has been dumped in Northern Ireland? Uh, previously, uh, whenever I was Minister in, back in 2009, in fact, Eamon Ryan was the Minister then as well uh, for the environment at that stage, um, an agreement was drawn up uh, whereby repatriation of waste on 20 sites um, which was illegally tipped uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, emanating from the, the, the Republic of Ireland, um, that that would be repatriated. Um, as my understanding, um, only around half of the sites have been cleared, and that leaves around 100,000 uh, cubic tonnes of waste um, still illegally tipped in Northern Ireland uh, in sites that have not been secured. And consequently, I have raised this issue again as to why it has not happened. Um, the, the reason given um, is that they have capacity issues in, in, in taking the waste. Um, however, that is not something which I find acceptable, and I will continue to work to ensure that this piece of work that has been let go by the by, in spite of an agreement having been made, uh, is something that will be uptaken again, and that we will ensure that the waste um, sites. Um, that the material on those sites are removed and taken back to the Republic of Ireland. Call Melissa McHugh. Well, I've got to uh, Minister, I note just your uh, commitment to cooperation in environmental matters, and I'm sure that you're aware uh, in the recent news just of the major uh, bog slippage that we had uh, on the Tyrone Donegal border at the, uh, Moon, uh, at the Mean Bog uh, wind farm. Uh, and that has impacted on the, um, the Moornbeg River, which is major tributary to the Derg River, uh, a, a renowned fish and salmon uh, watercourse. Uh, Minister, what work uh, will you do in order to ensure that we have that cooperation with the authorities on both sides of the border to minimise uh, the impact of that bog slippage on both fauna, uh, 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 floral, and the fish stocks of the Moornbeg River? 
Well, of course, the Lux Agency, which is a cross-border body, has been in engaging, as has NIEA, in investigations um, since uh, this slippage has occurred. Um, quite astonishing. I watched, I watched a video of it, and it was quite astonishing um, to see the amount of material just moving um, slowly but inexorably. Uh, and I know that Donegal County Council um, have organised a meeting today. Uh, my officials will be in attendance at that meeting. Um, as this is something which has uh, a material impact on, on both sides of the border. And it is quite clear that um, the rivers have been affected by large amounts of peaty soils um, coming into the rivers. At this stage, the oxygen levels within the rivers are still high, um, which is good. However, um, fish gills can become contaminated with high levels of uh, peat and consequently die uh, from that source. Um, so there has been small levels of fish kill identified at this stage, um, but that, that does not mean that that's, that is going to be the case. Um, it is not particularly easy to, to identify just at this stage, given the amount of peat and so forth that's in the water, uh, given the high, le high levels of water at this, at this, at the, at this point as well. Um, but all of those things will be investigated in due course, and uh, we will continue to work with the authorities. Uh, in the Republic of Ireland um, on this matter. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, and thank the, the Minister for his answer so far. The, um, in relation to the statement, I know a heavy um, emphasis has been placed on the exchange and cooperation of information on marine bathing waters, rivers and the lakes. Um, could the Minister advise, please, just what cooperation has happened uh, on the specific issue of the strain of COVID that has been identified in Denmark in mink, and as we know, the, these mink inhabit certainly our, our waterways and rivers. And if there has been collaboration between both departments, what that is? Well, we suspect that the problem with wild mink um, is less of an issue because um, they haven't come into contact with humans in general. The problem is with farm mink. Um, now, there are three far mink farms in the Irish Republic. Uh, there hasn't been any here since 2002. Uh, the keeping of mink was banned uh, for fur, uh, but that practice has continued uh, in Ireland. And uh, consequently, there are three farms um, of, of farm mink, which I believe are going to be run down over the course of the next year. Uh, so it is a matter for uh, health authorities in the Republic of Ireland um, to keep a close eye on that circumstance. I believe that there are some 17 million mink in Denmark, and originally it had been planned to, to have an immediate slaughter of them all. Um, I don't think that that is now the case. Um, however, it is an issue of significant concern because a lot of effort and uh, money has been expended on developing vaccines. Um, we know that one is, is virtually ready to go. We know that another one is going to be coming very shortly after that, uh, but it would be of significant concern if a different uh, mutation of COVID happened through the mink, and consequently those vaccines then um, were not fit for purpose as a result of that. So it is something that I believe that any country that has mink farms uh, needs to be acting very responsibly about at this moment in time. My preference would be that the, the mink farms would cease to be in existence. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, thank you very much for your statement and answers so far. Minister, can you, um, can you tell me what cooperation there's been with regarding cross-border fly tipping, particularly from homes around the border areas, because much of, that, much of the waste from homes is dumped in Northern Ireland because there's an expense to have this waste collected from the homes in the Republic? Uh, the member uh, puts her finger on, on a, a problem which is more of a problem emanating from the from, from Republic of Ireland than it is from here because um, obviously within our rating system, uh, one of the benefits that people have is that their waste is collected. Uh, so therefore, the issue of fly tipping, um, it arises but not to the same extent. And uh, it is a matter for local authorities in the first instance uh, to deal with fly tipping. Uh, but as certainly issues around waste in general, um, we will press very uh, hard and, and, and do have a level of cross-border cooperation 
but press that as much information as possible flows to each side so that people involved in the illegal tipping of waste um, are caught and prosecuted for, the, for their activities. I call John Blair. Speaker, can I also thank the, the Minister for the statement and, and the detail uh, in that, including that which is reassuring, such as the cooperation envisaged uh, on marine uh, waters, uh, as well as the joint programme of enforcement and collaboration on, on, on environmental crime. Uh, can I ask in that regard how the proposed Office of Environmental Protection, with only one Northern Ireland representative, can play a part in intergovernmental arrangements already making progress here? Well, the Office of Environmental Protection um, will be delivering on the same standards as currently exist um, under the EU and which are currently monitored by the European Commission. Um, therefore, the standards that exist in the Republic of Ireland will be the same standards that exist um, in the United Kingdom until the United Kingdom takes uh, legislation which may uh, produce different standards. Those may be higher standards. Um, or they may, they may be, be lower standards, but that is a, a matter uh, to be de debated by the UK Parliament or indeed by this Assembly, um, should we wish to change standards. But at this moment in time, the standards will be the same, um, and the Office of Environmental Protection will have that role to ensure that the standards that have been set are standards that are implemented um, right across the United Kingdom after it leaves the European Union. They call Harry Harvey. Much, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Um, we're back to waste again, and just wondering what commitments have been made to ensure greater enforcement measures have been put in place to stop illegal waste practices. Thank you. Well, clearly, there's a series of um, rules um, relating to waste, and, and in terms of, of, of um, the, the tipping of waste and, and illegal management of waste, and really. Uh, it is a matter for the courts in terms of how, how they, 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 they actually um, use the fine process that is available. Um, there is substantial opportunities to find individuals who are involved in the illegal management of waste. Um, we all know that <coughs> there is substantial money to be made in the illegal management of waste. Our department has a polluter pays principle, so those people caught um, uh, and, uh, in, in dealing with uh, illegal management of waste, um, we will be ensuring that they pay for all of the costs associated with properly disposing of it. Uh, so there is a series of measures there, um, but I, I would accept that those measures um, may be made stronger uh, because people are still involved in this uh, sector. So whether it's enforcement of it, or whether it is actually the, the, the fines that are imposed, um, we need to ensure that what is done is enough uh, to put people off engaging in this activity. I call Philip McGuigan. No, good. Can, call you. Uh, can I, uh, just given the recent discovery of two birds, uh, a swan in Derry and a falcon in Limerick with uh, bird flu, can I ask the Minister? What are the contingency plans within the department here in the north uh, in the event of an outbreak of bird flu? And then subsequently, what is the level of cooperation uh, across the island to monitor the situation? Yeah, it is very concerning. and um, There have been a couple of outbreaks in, in England, um, obviously the, the, the one in Limerick and, of, uh, and the mute swan that was picked up in Loch Beg. And that is a matter of significant concern to us because the poultry industry in Northern Ireland is worth around £900 million. It employs directly 5,500 people, uh, so it is an industry which is hugely important to us. I should say that every uh, keeper of birds um, are supposed to register with DERA, so that even if that is only two or three chickens scratching about in your back garden, they are supposed to be registered. Uh, DERA have a website set up. Um, which identifies how you best manage your biosecurity arrangements. Um, DERA has been escalating through the veterinary section um, its response, and we are not at the point yet where, where, where birds should be closed up. But nonetheless, um, we are pressing and impressing upon people the need to take all of the biosecurity steps 
um, that, that uh, they should, and have been indicating very clearly what those biosecurity measures are. So fundamentally, the most important thing that a chicken farm um, or any keeper of, of, of poultry at this minute can do is to manage their biosecurity particularly well. And uh, if we believe that, then we need to move to that next stage of uh, closing up the free-range birds. Uh, then that's a step that we'll recommend uh, in the not too distant future, if that's required. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for his, his statement and his answer so far. Uh, the Minister made reference to the implications of the withdrawal from the EU and preparations for the end of the transition period. But what are the implications for Northern Ireland if there are no preparations ready to hit the ground running come the end of the transition period? Well, I can assure the member that there has been a lot of preparation. Um, it's a little difficult um, to prepare sometimes for something and you don't know what uh, you're preparing for. And therefore, the conclusion of the negotiation is something which is absolutely critical. I believe that that may take place this week. I believe that's the, that's the aim. Um, but there are still outstanding issues, um, particularly in state aid and on fisheries. Uh, which uh, are the two issues which seem to be um, preventing a trade deal um, at this stage. For Northern Ireland, there are particular issues of concern which arise um, through the implementation of the protocol. Um, firstly, seeds that are imported to Northern Ireland from Scotland. In fact, seeds that are imported to all of Ireland, uh, mainly from Scotland, around 90 per cent of seed used. Um, <clears throat> That is, is currently a problem um, around the importation um, as a result of the protocol. Uh, there is another uh, group called PMR, and that relates to uh, minced beef, um, to processed um, meats, and accounts for up to 30,000 tonnes of meats imported every year into Northern Ireland. As things stand, that would stop immediately on the 1st of January, so that isn't even a matter of having an export health certificate. You just don't import it, full stop. So if one takes, um, for example, your lasagnas in Iceland, and in fact many of, the, many of the products you would get along our supermarket shelves or, and, and our shop shelves um, would become empty. Um, and that is purely a matter for the European Union in terms of how um, they respond. I would add further there is the issue of the importation of both um, red meat, which is around one quarter of a billion pounds per year, and indeed a considerable amount of, of uh, chicken um, white meat, uh, which is imported to Northern Ireland, processed in Northern Ireland, and in the main goes back to GB. Um, there are issues around, around that. And these are all issues which we really need to be sorted this week. And we need to get solutions to this. It is not about um, damage in the single market um, or reducing the quality of things within the single market. It needs to be stressed. Um, but it is hugely detrimental uh, to Northern Ireland, both at a consumer level and at a business level, if we cannot get these issues resolved and will have serious implications for Northern Ireland. The executive is aware of it. Um, and the executive have mandated myself to, to write on its behalf um, to the European Union um, on this issue uh, to see that and to impress the need um, of getting these matters resolved um, to everybody's satisfaction. I call the chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Declan McAleer. Uh, thank you, Ken Corlia. Um, uh, Minister, in paragraph 9 of your statement, you made reference to the importance of clean air. I wonder, could you update us? Uh, has there been any progress made on developing a clean air strategy discussion document uh, for here and indeed on a cross border basis? Thank you. I thank the member um, for the issue, and, and we did discuss uh, the issue of clean air and, and where, where cooperation could take place. Um, the discussion document that uh, we're working on, on, on clean air, is one that we will certainly be uh, intending um, to bring to the, the Assembly uh, this year and uh, therefore have it go out um, to the public um, so that we can have that consultation process taking place uh, on clean air. Very important matter, particularly for those um, who are living within cities. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his statement. The Minister's statement refers to uh, greater cross-border work on increasing water quality. In this regard, such collaboration will absolutely be essential in investigating and mitigating against the environmental damage caused by the peat landslide that the Minister referenced at Mean Bog, which has caused contamination of the Mornbeg River and local waterways. I visited yesterday, Minister, with Councillor Stephen Edwards, uh, and there is a clear amount of anxiety amongst my constituents in Cleeter, Ahi Arne, Castle Laird, and Ardstraw. Can the Minister outline what actions his department has taken to reassure the public in that area that his department is doing everything possible to mitigate against, against contamination of these waterways and whether he knows the root cause of the slippage problem? Thank you, Minister. I thank the member for the question. On the 13th of November, around 1.30, NIEA were informed of a landslide at a peat bog adjacent to the Mornbeg River in Donegal. NIEA contacted Northern Ireland Water and the Locks Agency regarding the event. And in response, Northern Ireland Water have shut down their intake of raw water from the River Derg as a precaution. As the incident occurred on the southern side of the border, the investigation and the initial response to the event is the responsibility of the Locks Agency, and they have been on site investigating the matter. NIA tasked a water quality inspector to assess the impact on the Mourne Beg and Derg rivers on Saturday morning. The initial assessment showed that the oxygen levels have not been suppressed but that the high levels of suspended solids was affecting aquatic life, including a fish farm business. Locks Agency were working with the owners to mitigate the impact, including the deployment um, of our leaders. We call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his statement. I would be grateful if uh, the Minister could provide some further detail on the LIFE projects uh, referenced in paragraph 7. Um, in terms of the life projects that uh, we mentioned, um, there's a number of them have taken place. Um, I'm just checking here. Yeah, um, those those have been achieved um, through working with both government departments, agencies, and, and partnerships um, operating in both jurisdictions. And uh, those life projects um, have environmental priorities. There's a small number of them, and. Uh, I'll uh, write to the member um, detailing him uh, or giving him the detail um, of the projects um, so they can get fully updated on it. Thank you. I call Keeva Archibald. And I thank the Minister for his statement and responses to questions so far. Um, um, the Minister will be well aware that ammonia emissions are a particular issue here, not just in the north but across the island. There will be a debate on the issue later this afternoon, um, and there has been work going on to inform an uh, ammonia strategy. So I was just wanting to ask the Minister when we can expect publication of the draft strategy. Again, that is um, at the latter stages of. of, of of preparation and will be uh, produced before the end of this year. Um, ammonia is, is, is an area of significant concern for us. Uh, we know that most of ammonia is produced um, on farms and therefore uh, there is a course of actions that need to be taken uh, to reduce the levels of ammonia as we continue to um, increase our agricultural output. Uh, it is important that we support industry uh, to increase. Uh, its output, uh, but that that is done in a way which is uh, less harmful to the environment. And one of the things that we uh, want to do is to ensure that over the course of the next number of years, uh, the ammonia outputs on farms uh, is reduced. And there are ways and means of doing that. And uh, one of those means is, is through um, low emission spreading equipment. Um, we've just recently launched a grant um, which will support a number of things, but has, has priority, priorities or, or uh, people will get additional points in terms of that grant uh, for such equipment, um, for the covering of tanks, uh, for better separation of slurry and, 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 and slurry scraping. Um, and so there's a series of measures there that we're already working on, which will help to reduce, um, if I get more funding, uh, there is the opportunity of making a much more significant uh, reduction in ammonia, uh, so that is an area of work that we will continue to impress upon. I call Emma Sheeran. Thank you, Juliet. Thanks to the Minister for his statement and for the, the questions he's answered thus far. Minister, could you provide an update on the joint programme um, of cross-border co collaboration and enforcement in regards to tackling environmental crime? 
Well, at our meeting, the ministers agreed that continued cooperation in five key areas of mutual benefit to both sides uh, and future development would be potential. And that involved environmental research and reporting, environmental protection and sustainable development, water and waste management, wastewater management, waste management across border context and EU funding. And so we are encouraging in all of those things sustainable development, encouraging cooperation sharing, cooperation exchange information on marine issues, cooperation collaboration on water and wastewater service areas, and the promotion of a circular economy and uh, a joint programme of enforcement and collaboration on tackling environmental crime and cooperation with a view to maximising drawdown of EU funding. So environmental crime is very much a key area uh, within those, those areas of cooperation. Call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for your statement. Uh, it contains um, an update on EU funding, uh, including uh, existing interreg funding um, uh, and also um, Horizon funding looking forward. Uh, what it does not mention, Minister, and it would be good to get your thoughts on it, is the European Green Deal, which is uh, an enormous uh, multi-year plan of investment by the European Union in, um, in the transition to lower carbon economy. Given, for example, large parts of Northern Ireland's energy generation sector will remain in the EU transmissions scheme, given uh, some of the potential uh, benefits from the protocol, notwithstanding the issues he described earlier. Um, can he ask his officials to look uh, and work with theirs on the other side of the, uh, officials on the other side of the border at potential benefits from North, for Northern Ireland projects from what could be a £20 billion plus uh, just transition fund in terms of uh, green transition? This is somewhere where we might be able to benefit. Can I ask the Minister to really look at the European Green Deal and, and figure out how Northern Ireland could benefit from it? Well, obviously, some funding uh, continues to go on, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that the UK has left the European Union, and certainly um, funding uh, will go on to 2023, uh, as set out in the statement. With uh, um, consideration of the ETS scheme, uh, that is one where we are paying into very heavily, um, close to £60 million a year, in around £60 million per year. Uh, and as two new schemes are, as a new scheme will be set up um, for um, UK under that, uh, but only around 18% of our um, payments will go to the UK scheme. Um, the other 82% uh, will go to the EU. I should say that over the course of the years, we have never drawn down any money, uh, monies back um, from the ETS scheme. Uh, as a result of them having a, a, a three-project uh, rule per country, and um, we, we haven't, uh, you know, given that the UK is quite a large country, uh, it, it, it hasn't benefited Northern Ireland. So we're asking the question: um, Will Northern Ireland have its own status as a country in the, this instance? Because Northern Ireland remains part of this of, of this ETS scheme outside of the UK. In which case, um, that would allow us three schemes per year, or three schemes to, to bid for, and uh, that would be hugely progressive if that was the case. Um, however, um, we haven't had the benefit uh, in terms of the emission trading scheme thus far uh, that I'd like to have seen, uh, and I think that Northern Ireland has many wonderful opportunities uh, in terms of hydrogen, in terms of um, uh, of how we, we, we manage. Um, our, our, our carbon, um, how we can better capture it, and so forth. And uh, I think that um, it would be good if the European Union would identify that Northern Ireland um, could access um, the, 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 the status of its own country and consequently be able to um, draw money from the scheme. I call Sean Lynch. The Karen Collier. I thank the Minister for her statement. Minister, what assurances can you offer to the many organisations who have contacted myself and other MLAs regarding the re replacement of lost EU funding as we come to the end of the transition period? Mark. Well, there has been a rollover of funding um, through to, um, by, by the UK Government, and therefore uh, that funding that is currently in place for the environmental sector um, continues to be in place as we go forward. And I call 
Claire Bailey. Thank you for the, to the Minister um, for the statements and for bringing them forward in a timely manner. That was much appreciated as well. Thank you. I know members have made, um, or may que give you questions on enforcement, but I want to go uh, further. Minister, has there been a level of discussion around how we deal with transboundary environmental breaches under existing EU directives? post-transition, and I know that, for example, ammonia was brought up already, but it's certainly not the only issue. So when we know ammonia, that we're not meeting our EU directive targets under that, you know, but that's not the farmer's fault, that's certainly not the chicken's fault, that's the, the, the result of policies. So how are we going to meet those targets um, post-transition um, across the island? There's a whole series of issues in our right environment. So, you know, UK government has set out uh, its policy of being carbon neutral by 2050, and that uh, sets significant challenges. And you'll not achieve carbon neutrality without significant investment. And that's just a reality. So uh, people need to put their money uh, where their mouths are when it comes to the environment, and that's one of the things that I will be raising um, at an executive level as to how all of our departments pull together uh, to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 and what investment is required to achieve that. Uh, so, for example, agriculture, energy and transport account for um, just over, uh, around 70 per cent um, of the emissions. So, consequently, we need to have significant investments in those areas. Energy has uh, demonstrated that there has been significant reductions in, in its uh, carbon. Uh, so, we are looking at over 40 per cent, for about 45 per cent of our energy coming from renewable sources now. Um, however, some of that energy isn't properly captured, so we need to ensure that we have the capacity to, to capture all of the energy that is produced. Um, transportation, you know, COVID has demonstrated uh, that people do not need to travel as much. Uh, those of us who, who were on the roads this morning will have noticed that there is considerable reduction in the number of vehicles on the roads. If you drive past our government car parks, you'll notice a considerable reduction of vehicles in the car parks. So there is opportunities uh, to do more working from home, uh, and there is the opportunities of using uh, the electric car system plus more fuel-efficient cars. The only caveat I have about the electric cars is how they're used at end of life and the other materials that, that, that are used in the production of those vehicles to ensure that there isn't another kind of environmental damage done um, as a consequence of that. Uh, but there is those opportunities in transport. Agriculture is a huge issue, uh, particularly for Northern Ireland, which is producing more than 10 per cent of the food uh, that the entire United Kingdom produces. And how do we actually manage that in a way uh, which reduces the amount of emissions? So we did uh, speak about ammonia. Um, I want to look at issues around uh, nitrogen, and about phosphates and how we can actually better manage uh, the materials and nutrients that, that, that are excreted uh, so that that can be used uh, for something other than just straightforward slurry, which is being apply, applied to land. That will involve investment. Um, and <clears throat> there's just a whole series of things. Now, in terms of this, um, I, I'm very happy to cooperate um, with, with uh, people in, in similar areas to ourselves, be that in other parts of the United Kingdom or be that in the Republic of Ireland, because ultimately all of us have very similar problems and therefore our responses are going to be similar. So the research um, that can be conducted uh, that will allow us to take the appropriate steps in terms of environmental management is research that I am happy to support um, and work with and cooperate. Um, whether that be with uh, uh, colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, Scotland, England or Wales, I am very happy to cooperate with other colleagues in identifying solutions that we can all apply uh, in delivering a better environmental outcome. I call Jim Allister. Could I take the Minister back to the Interreg 5A programme? Now that we have left the EU, would the Minister remind the House of the funding formula for Interreg 5A? Uh, and would he also remind the House about the match funding aspect with an indication of what that's going to cost the public purse here in Northern Ireland? 
Um, I don't have the figures to hand in terms of uh, the match funding that, that is required under the Dreg 5A. I do know that uh, we have been able to um, fund around £89 million pounds worth, or euros worth of projects um, over the course of the last six years, and that we will be able to continue to access EU money. Um, I know that um, significant amounts of money have been spent directly and, and, and uh, into Northern Ireland. Um, some have been based on, on cross-border projects, um, but that has been something where we have been able to be um, net receivers of, of income as opposed to, to givers, and uh, that is something which I regard as being positive, uh, but that we will continue to, to, to work uh, to secure as much of this funding as possible um, for the environmental benefit that will be arrived and achieved um, as a consequence of it. Nicole, Jerry, Carl. In relation to environmental protection, when they asked that the ministers discuss measures about keeping fossil fuels in the ground, uh, my party colleague Bree Smith TD previously brought a proposal uh, to do such a thing in the South, but it was guillotined by previous governments. So, was any discussion had about legislation uh, and policies and proposals uh, to ensure uh, fossil fuels are kept in the ground? Thank you. No such discussion took place, and of course, um, keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Um, is something which may be appropriate whenever you have fully identified alternatives to fossil, fossil fuels. Um, but sometimes I wonder um, where people are, are objecting to extracting fossil fuels closer to home uh, whenever you are importing fossil fuels um, from regions which are deeply unstable. Regions which use uh, the money that, the, that they gain from fossil fuels to engage in, in wars, whether it be cyber wars or, 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 or um, wars which involve um, traditional weapons. Um, so, not utilising fossil fuels um, closer to home is not necessarily something which is good for the environment, but can be a very good uh, for people who don't care about the environment and for people who don't care about human rights. Um, and that is uh, something that is of concern to all of us. And that concludes questions on this statement. Could I ask members just to take your ease for a moment or two, please?